Welcome to Financial Modeling with Hooper. This is just a quick video to give you an introductory overview to the course and some of the things that are going to be important to me this semester. Let's say we wanted to do a simple calculation in Excel to look at um, future value of an investment. And let's say that the present value of that investment uh, was $1,000 and that the periodic interest rate 5% and the periods that we got to compound that rate over were six. So if we invested $1,000 at 5% annual interest for six years, then we could calculate some kind of a future value. We know what that will be. It's probably bothering you already that this column is not wide enough to hold some of my labels. And a lot of people like to come up here and double click between the B and the C and then it widens out to the widest label or value in that column. What I prefer is to highlight some cells that I care about, do an alt HOI that we'll talk about later. You notice it only widened it to the ones that I cared about and it let this label continue to wrap. That's a pretty important concept. So another important concept is that we make calculations in Excel. Uh, in this case we're going to say the future value is equal to the present value times 1 plus the interest rate. I could do 0.05 as an interest rate, or I could do 5% as an interest rate. Excel really doesn't know or care the difference. It's all in how it formats 0.05. We want to take that to the exponent of the number of periods and see that that investment would return us 1340 over time. Probably the most, most common shortcut that I use other than undo would be to try to copy the format of C4 down to C7. So control C everyone knows is copy. Uh, there are a lot of ways to get to paste special. Uh, I'm going to go up here to the paste menu by hitting alt H for home, V for paste menu, S for special. Another way to get here is alt ES a lot of different ways to get to paste special. You know, control Alt V, stuff like that. But I've copied this cell. I'd like to paste its format here. So I'm going to choose formats by hitting the T. And then I'm going to choose OK by hitting Enter. And now the future value is formatted like the present value. The most popular question in my class is, Mr. Hooper, would you please put a formula text? Because I didn't see what you typed. But if you'll type in formula text and pointed it at your formula, then I can see the formula that you typed. So hopefully some of you are throwing things at your screen by now and saying, why didn't you just refer to the C4 in your formula and the C5 and the C6? Because if I change that to an 8% interest rate, it'd be really nice if the answer updated itself and it doesn't the way I've done it. I'm going to control Z to undo that. But if instead of a thousand, I had clicked on that cell, and if instead of 5%, I had clicked on that cell and so forth. Now, I can't really click on that cell. It's not visible. So I'm going to click on the one above it, hit the down arrow key. If I had enter those as references, now when I change one of the inputs, it updates its own. That's really the beauty of the spreadsheet. Magic Blackboard, I think, is what the inventor called it the first time. So I'll undo that to get back to the original answer. But again, by using those references, then our model becomes dynamic. We have some inputs and some outputs, and it's dynamic. So this is Hooper's first rule of modeling. Hooper's second rule of modeling, and we'll do this by going to cell styles. Again, the Alt key brings up H. If I type H and then J for cell styles, then I can use my down arrows and come over here and choose inputs. I apologize for the color that Microsoft chose for the input format, but we're just going to use it because it's their standard. And then here, Alt H J again gets me to where I can choose an output format. We're not changing anything about these cells except the formatting. So when you see something in my class that kind of has this ugly Texas color washed out, you know that that's an input into a model. When you see something that's a gray box with some bold 
letters, bold characters in it, should say text, then you know that's an output to the model. So let's talk about what we could do with a model like this. We know how this works and we wanted to see some sensitivities. We could say, well, what's the sensitivity to our interest rate? And what's the sensitivity to our periods? So I could look at interest rates from zero to 1% and so on. Now, you know I don't like the mouse. My reputation hopefully precedes me, but this is one use for the mouse. Once I've typed the zero and the one, if I come down here to this little square at the bottom right, I can click on it and continue to fill that trend. There's really no better way to do that with a keyboard, so that's a, a reason to keep your mouse around. And then for periods, if we'd like to look at investing for zero time or one year, we'll do the same thing here. We could come in here and write a formula that says that the future value is equal to our present value times 1 plus the interest rate to the power of the number of periods. And if we check that, then sure enough, if we invest at 0% for 0 years, we still have our present value. If we came over here and said we want to invest $1,000 at 1% for one year, then we have $1,010. So the same people that were throwing things at their screen when I was typing, when I was breaking modeling rule number one, hopefully are still throwing things at their screen because I'm breaking modeling rule number three, which is if I would use absolute references correctly, then I could write this formula one time and I could copy it across these 70 cells. To explain what absolute references are, let's think about relative references first. If I came into this formula and just copied it down here to look at 2% in two years of investment, what happened? All three of these references, which previously looked at 1%, one year, and $1,000, now we're looking at blank cells. That's, of course, because Excel just thought we wanted to look two cells up, two cells over, and about half a dozen cells to the left and a few cells up. So relative references are what we were using when we copied that cell. That's bad, so I'll Control Z to undo. And we'll go in, click on the C4, and let's set that to absolute references. That means absolutely look at C4. We'll put a dollar sign in front of the C and a dollar sign in front of the 4 by hitting the F4 key. And then we'll click over on I5, hit the F4 key, G7, hit the F4 key. And now it will absolutely look at those three cells. That's not so great either, because if I copy and paste that, it's still looking at those three cells. What we really need is to look at C4 all the time, so absolute references on C4. But when we're looking for an interest rate, we always want to look on row 5. So we want the 5 to be absolute, but the column... I needs to change with wherever we paste the formula to. Similarly, over here when we're looking at periods, we need to always choose column G, so we want that to be absolute, but the row number needs to be relative to whatever row number our formula gets pasted on. If I always want to look at C4 in all 70 formulas here, then I need a dollar sign in front of the C and a dollar sign in front of the 4. The easiest way to get that is click on that reference and hit the F4 key, the function 4 key. And it locks both the column and the row so that anywhere I copy that formula, it will refer to C4. In this case, I only want to copy the row. So across all these 70 cells, I want them to always look at row 5, but I only want them to look at the column that they're in. And so I'm going to hit F4 once, twice. And it locks row 5, but not the column. And then finally, for the periods, I want to lock the column, but not the row. So I will click on the G7 somewhere and hit F4 once, twice, three times. And it leaves the dollar sign in front of the column, but not the row. Now I can control C to copy, select all these cells by holding down shift and moving my arrow keys, and then control V to paste. And now I have a nice little table that shows the sensitivities. 
And the more I look at that formula by hitting F2, it's always looking at the present value. It's always looking at the correct interest rate and the correct number of periods and calculating what the future value would be for that particular scenario. The next thing I'd like to introduce is Goal Seek, maybe my favorite part of Excel. If I wanted to know what interest rate I would need to get to have a future value of $1,500, I could pull up Goal Seek. Alt to pull up the hotkeys, A for data, W for what if analysis, and G for Goal Seek. And it says you could set cell C7. Notice that since I was already on C7, then that's already in the set cell box. To value, I'll hit tab to go to the next box. And I'd like to set that equal to 1500 by changing what cell. Well, I could do that by changing my initial investment, by changing my interest rate, or by changing my periods. Notice that they're all three formatted as inputs. So by changing cell will always be an input. Set cell will always be an output. So let's do it this time by changing the interest rate. I would need about a 7% interest rate to get a future value of $1,500. In this class, I'll always ask you for two decimal places on interest rates. So if I come up to that cell, under the home menu, there's a button that increases the decimal places on a number that we're showing. So if I say Alt and then H for home, zero to move the decimal, then I'm showing one. So I'm doing Alt H zero again, then it shows the two decimal places. And it was pretty close to seven, but now we have more detail on it. If Goal Seek is my favorite thing, then my second favorite thing in Excel is probably a what if data table. We're going to use a what if data table to recreate this same thing that we did here. So the first thing I'm going to do is copy. Actually, I'm going to copy, paste, and I'm going to delete the formulas that we used. I'm going to have Excel fill it in for us. We'll do a separate video on what if data tables, but if you'd like to do some research on your own, look up what if data table on Google and find out how to do this. If we know the sensitivities to one input and the sensitivities to another input, and we know what cell we'd like to monitor, in this case C7, then we'll put a reference to cell C7. And when we tell Excel to do this, what it's going to do is for all 70 cells in here, it's going to put that input in the interest rate, it's going to put that input in the periods, and it's going to take that answer and put it right here as a value. Then it's going to move to the next one, and the next one, and the next one, until it does all 70. I think you'll be impressed how quickly it does it. Let's select the area that we want the data table. Go back to Alt A for data, W for what if, T for data table. So in this course, you'll probably about a thousand times hit Alt A W T, and that will be your what if data table. It says, where did you want me to put these row input cells? These inputs are in a row, and we want them to go into this interest rate. And then these cells are in a column, and we want them to go into this periods. If we say OK, then notice we get exactly the same numbers as we did above. And that's a what if data table. Again, we'll talk about how to do that in a separate video, but this is an introductory video where we've covered the three modeling rules, the goal seek function, and the what if data table function. That's a huge chunk of the course, but let's just get it all out there in the open today. I hope you've enjoyed this video and look forward to seeing you in class.